more often than not, I find that my music students learn scales, but they don't know scales. They learn how to play a scale, but they don't know how to use a scale. And today I'm going to be talking about the differences between learning a scale and knowing a scale. In addition to that, we're also going to cover what a scale is. We're going to talk about examples of scales, scales that are used, most common scales used in Western contemporary music. And then we're going to get into the six main aspects that I think are most impactful in learning uh, and knowing a scale as well. Now, if this is your first time over here, welcome. I'm glad you could join me on this journey. I'd love for you to subscribe and hit the notification icon so you never miss a video. I release these every Thursday. And if this is not your first time here, welcome back. Always a pleasure to have you here. Let's get into it. So first things first, what is a scale? A scale is a set of musical notes that are ordered by fundamental pitch or frequency. Now what that means is that if this is the A note in say, let's just call this the first octave, right? For a lack of a better term. So this is A in the first octave, and then this is A again in the second octave. What a scale is, is essentially a graduated set of tones between this octave and this octave. That's it, that's a scale. And a scale can be five notes, a scale can be seven notes, eight notes, you can have symmetrical scales, the list goes on and on, but we're not here to talk about all the different kinds of scales over here, right? We're here to talk about a fundamental philosophy that you can apply to knowing any musical concept at all. Let's talk about examples of scales. There's the major scale, minor scale, there's a harmonic minor scale, melodic minor scale, pentatonic scales, a whole tone scale, or a whole half scale, or a half whole scale, diminished scale. The list goes on and on, as I said. The most common types of scales used in Western contemporary music would probably be, in my opinion, the major scale, the natural minor scale, the minor pentatonic scale, and the major pentatonic scale. That's the meat and potatoes of my career as a professional musician, at least. Every now and then there's a little jazz gig or every now and then I'll do something that requires me to jump out of the box and do something out there. But for the most part, these are the scales that you're playing. Major scale, natural minor scale, minor pentatonic scale, major pentatonic scale. That's it. Now let's talk about learning a scale versus knowing a scale. As I said, it's so important to know a scale in order to effectively use it. It's not sufficient just to learn a scale. So I, had, I have students come in and say, well, hey, I want to learn the minor pentatonic scale, right? And I go, okay, well, this is the minor pentatonic scale. That is A minor pentatonic. And so for the purpose of this video, let's just stick to super basic A minor pentatonic scale, okay? Uh, now let's talk about this scale. This is a five note scale. Penta, five, tonic, tone, five tones. What are the six aspects? What are the six points that go into knowing a scale? It starts off by being able to play it ascending and descending. Now, as I said, a scale is a set of musical notes that are ordered by fundamental pitch or frequency. So any scale that is going up in pitch or frequency is an ascending scale. And if the pitch is going down, then it is a descending scale, right? So being able to play it ascending and descending, that's the first step to knowing the scale, right? But it's also part of learning it. Let's start from the top over here, fifth fret of the E string. That's the A minor pentatonic scale, ascending and descending. The second aspect that I think is important in knowing a scale is to be able to play it across the fretboard. Now there are many different philosophies in guitar, there are many different methodologies in guitar. The one that I learned was the caged system. And what that allows you to do is that allows you to take a scale, which is essentially five notes, and then plot it across the fretboard. So anywhere you are along the fretboard, you're right at home, if you've done your due diligence that is. So let me give you an example. The A minor pentatonic scale, we're going to start right here on the third fret. A minor pentatonic, let's just call that position one. Coming down position two, now position three.
and then we're back home right where we started. So we had one, two, three, four, five, and then we're back home again. So there are five different positions right from there. That's why you have C-A-G-E-D, caged. And that's where that comes from, okay? Uh, and we'll get into what the cage system is in another video, but this video is more just to get you to understand the different aspects in knowing a scale. The next one is finger exercises. Now, finger exercises are really just to establish that hand-eye coordination. It's gonna help with dexterity. It's gonna help with you being able to manipulate the scale the way you want, as opposed to just being confined to one single pattern that you learn. Let me give you a few examples over here. I used to make up little games with myself and say, all right, I'm gonna play the pentatonic scale in groups of four or groups of five. And what that looks like is, let's say we do groups of four, I would go one, two, three, four, and then start on the second note, one, two, three, four, and then start on the third note, one, two, three, four, and then fourth. Now, you can definitely play this with a metronome as well. It takes a little bit of thinking about what you're doing. Once you get the hang of it, it's super easy, just as, uh, just as anything else is. The next step is licks. And what I mean by licks is vocabulary. Let's start thinking about guitar playing as a language, as a means of communicating, right? And if you were to think back to when you started learning the language that you speak right now, you probably learned from your parents, from your teachers, from your friends, from watching TV, from listening to the radio, uh, from reading, all sorts of different inputs. And that's exactly what should be happening even with guitar. You should be learning licks from not just guitar, but also like saxophone or uh, violin or any, any other source as well. The more you put in, the more input there is, the richer and better the output is. And that's what I have found in my, my personal development as a player as well. So I'd say learning vocabulary. Now let's say you're working with, you're working on A minor pentatonic. You wanna be learning vocabulary in that key, at least in that scale. So if you're working on the pentatonic scale, you wanna learn vocabulary that is within that scale. A couple of different examples would be, So that's mixing a little bit of major and minor there together. If I were to just go strictly uh, a minor pentatonic, I'd go. Or uh, I could go. Just, just ideas of licks that are, that are just coming up right now. This is all pretty much improvised. So that's the next step, learning licks. It's so important. And if you learn two licks a week and just maintain that for a few months, by the end of like two or three months, you're gonna have a little library of licks, right? So what you wanna do is start learning the licks uh, week one and then practice that, practice those two licks all week long. The next week, learn two more. But make sure that you practice these licks as well. Carry these over to week two and then and then so on and so forth and by the end of week eight or week 12 or whatever it is that you're on you're going to find that you have that much more vocabulary and from those licks you're going to be able to kind of piece together other little licks and little pieces of vocabulary that are going to help you express uh, and just be a more expressive player basically uh, the next step is going to be ear training now this is something that gets overlooked by 90% of students that I teach. And this is so crucial to be able to pick out what is happening in a scale. What do I mean by ear training? What I mean is you have a key, which is A, right? And then you have notes that come after that. So A, C, D, E, G, A. Now all of these are scale degrees. You have one, then you have C, which is the flat third. Then you have D, which is a perfect fourth, then you have E, which is a perfect fifth, and then you have G, which is the flat seven. So these are all scale degrees in relation to that one, 
in relation to the root a so you have c mm -hmm. is a minor third or a flat third depending on how you how you phrase that how you call it uh, so a minor mm -hmm. third or flat third in relation to that a and then the d mm -hmm. is a fourth in relation to the a mm -hmm. e so everything is in relation to the a right now each of those has a certain harmonic rub and it would really serve you well if you learned what that harmonic rub sounds like. So let's say this is A. Now what's the harmonic rub between A and C? That is it. So this is A and that's a flat third. That's what those two sound like together. Let's move on to the next one. So, or, or let's take another example. Let's take flat seven. So that's one, A, and then G, which is the flat seven played together. Just like that. And then if you heard them separately, one flat seven, one flat seven. The other thing is being able to sing these notes also is, uh, is it's gonna greatly benefit you because one, you're gonna be able to note match or tone match or pitch match very important uh, it's also going to help you sing and um, if you can sing and play an instrument I don't think you're going to have any trouble finding work so ear training is super important and you can start off very simple just doing pitch matching right you play a note A C D E G and just kind of pitching, just matching the pitch of the note that you're playing. And then the second step would be to play something or have somebody else play something and then guess what the note is. That's a, that's a really fun exercise that you can try with your friends, your buddies, whoever's around. And the last step is application in a live situation. Now the reason we're doing all of this stuff, the reason why I do all of this stuff at least, is so that I can recall or I can just manipulate the scale and do the things that I'm hearing in my head real time. That really is the bottom line. We're just trying to be able to shorten the time between when the idea pops into your head to execution. That's it. And all of the exercises and all of the little things that you do to get to know a scale better is just to help you facilitate that process. So the last and final step that I think goes into knowing a scale is being able to apply whatever idea in that scale in a live situation. Because there is a certain urgency and a certain immediacy that comes with playing live. There's really no time to mess around. There's no time to sort of like figure things out. You execute in the moment. And if you fall flat on your face, try it again. That's fine. It's okay. But that is the urgency and the immediacy of live music, which is why it's so powerful, right? So there you go. Those are the six aspects that I feel go into knowing a scale. It's, it's also important to learn the scale, but in addition to learning it, I think it's important that you also know a scale. And you can apply this to any scale or any mode or any chord or any musical concept actually that you're working on. And you can divide it into the operative aspects, the operative elements that go into actually, all right, how am I using this scale? And if you can put those things down on paper, I think you're going to have an organized way of practicing and approaching the instrument, and you're going to see so many more great benefits coming from there. That's about all I had for you today. I hope that was helpful. I hope you found it entertaining and informative as well. Uh, do with it as you will. Go forth and prosper. I hope you do well with it. And if you have any questions or things are not clear to you, come in me in the comments below. You know what to do, and I'll hit you back with some suggestions. All right, then. Have a good one. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.